Okay, why don't we, uh, if we could get started. I, I would like to say before, we're going to talk about naloxone, but before we start, I'd just like to make a, a point about what happened in Orlando uh, over the weekend. That was a tragedy. Uh, that was an act of terror. It was a hate crime. It was the worst evidence of mass shooting that has ever happened in this country, ever. And uh, we need to understand as Pennsylvanians uh, and as Americans that we are better than this. The evil that uh, showed itself, reared its ugly head over the weekend is not us. And I want to make sure the, the families and the loved ones of the victims understand that Pennsylvanians extend their deepest sympathy and their deepest condolences uh, to all of them uh, who suffered uh, over the weekend. So if we could just maybe have a brief time of silence, I would appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. I want to thank all of you for, for joining me here today. Uh, I want to acknowledge a few people, Lieutenant Governor Mike Stack, who's going to say a few words. I'm with you, right, right in your right hand side. Okay. Uh, Secretary Gary Tennis, uh, Dr. Rachel Levine, uh, State Representative Mike Verb, who's back here, uh, and Northern Lancaster Regional Police Chief Dave Steffen. Dave used to be in York County, and Chris Benedetto. Chris, uh, want to make sure that, that uh, uh, welcome you and everybody for, for being here. Uh, there are a couple of things I want to just point out today. The first is that, that we want to, I want to announce that all of us have been successful in saving over a thousand lives uh, with naloxone in just a little over a year since we, we uh, started prescribing that. That's a big deal. Let's just remind ourselves how we got here. Last year, Dr. Levine uh, issued a standing order. Actually, she did two things. First of all, she made it available to law enforcement officials. And up until last year, I think there was only one county, was it Delaware County, that, that had uh, access to naloxone. But after uh, Dr. Levine did what she did, uh, every uh, law enforcement officer and firefighter uh, had access to it in Pennsylvania. The second thing she did was uh, issue a standing order, basically a prescription for all almost 13 million Pennsylvanians to make it available to all of us so that we can go to a, a pharmacy and we can uh, actually uh, uh, take advantage of the prescription we all have if we know someone using the Good Samaritan legislation that passed the House and the Senate uh, a few years ago. Was it a few years ago? Is that my right at that? That uh, we can use that to, to uh, give this drug to a loved one who is suffering. Uh, since that time, I want to get this right, state and local police, uh, uh, firefighters, sheriffs, first responders, school officials, and citizens at large have begun to carry this uh, highly effective tool in the fight against opioid and heroin abuse. So that's what we've done, and it has led to the thousand uh, save, life savings that we've had so far. Now, this is not incredibly important. I've gone around to have roundtables, and we've got to recognize that this is absolutely necessary to address the scourge of opioid abuse uh, in Pennsylvania, but it's not sufficient. It's a first step. I mean, one of the things is you bring someone back, that person needs to have follow-on treatment, and that just simply bringing someone back is not enough. On the other hand, if we don't bring someone back from death, then we'll never get the chance to provide the treatment that person needs, that, that victim needs. So, so this is really important. It's a, it's a very important first step, uh, and, and we have to make sure that we keep doing what we're doing in this regard. Fourth thing is my administration is con committed to doing whatever we can to continue to confront the, the challenge. Now, I put $34 million into my budget, which was going to be matched, I hope, with $18 million from the federal government which would mean over $50 million for 50 uh, treatment centers, uh, centers for excellence around the, the, the state that would allow for the post-treatment, ongoing treatment and reintegration into society and the economy uh, of, of over 11,000 uh, victims of substance use disorder. The idea is that, that these are not detox 
uh, treatment centers. These are not treatment centers where someone <coughs> lives uh, for 30, 60, 90 days, but after that treatment, this is the handoff to get that person back into society. Uh, and so uh, it, it has, uh, uh, again, it's, it's a start, it's, it's just part of what we need, but I think the reason there's such bipartisan support for this is that, that we all recognize that, that we cannot arrest our way to a cure, that we have a criminal justice problem here, that there are people who are preying on the victims of substance use disorder, and we've got to treat them as the <laughs> criminals they are, but there are too many people in our prisons who are suffering from a medical problem. Uh, and we could treat them more effectively and save more lives and do it all with a lot less money if we treated this as the disease that it really is. So there's real good bipartisan support for this. I think we all want to do the right thing because it's, it's right, but also because it's actually very smart. Uh, so this is, this is a really important thing that, that, that we're trying to do with the $34 million. And, and if I've heard criticism of it, uh, I've heard some criticism that, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing this the right way, but by and large, if, if there's any criticism, is are we sure that this is enough uh, in the first pass? So, so I think this is something that, that really does enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, we've also had, we at this point have 450 drug take back boxes, drop boxes, and, and the idea there is that, that you, you know, you, you end up with a prescription for oxycodone, uh, and, and uh, you have more pills than you need, what are you gonna do with them? You can't flush them down the toilet. You, you don't wanna leave them in the medicine, medicine cabinet because that could be a place that somebody finds them and, and steals them. Uh, so put them in a drug, a drug drop box. Uh, we now have 450 of those. The goal is to have at least one in every county. We have at least one in 60 counties. So we still have seven counties without a drop box, but we're working on that. Uh, we're trying to make uh, the uh, transition to behavioral health care in our managed care. Uh, operations uh, more seamless and easier. Uh, we are instituting a, a warm handoff policy so that health providers, when someone comes in with substance use disorder, they can uh, seamlessly go to a, a treatment center. Obviously, we need more treatment centers to make that, that available, but we also need uh, to make sure that, that, that people in the healthcare field feel comfortable in, in handing off. Uh, we're trying to do behind the walls treatment in our prisons to try to make sure that uh, people who have been incarcerated for a period of time, uh, that we help them with the transition to life beyond the walls uh, and that, that uh, we expedite, say, the, uh, their transition to behavioral health uh, treatment centers. So we're, we're doing more we, we, and we want to continue to do more. Uh, we've talked to medical schools and deans of medical schools recognize that they need to do a better job of, of uh, integrating uh, substance use disorder, that problem, that disease into their uh, medical curricula, uh, and they're doing that. Uh, we need to have uh, prescribing guidelines. Uh, we have a prescription drug monitoring program that goes into full effect in August. Uh, you know, are there some things we can do to make that even more effective than, than we think it's, it's going to be? So there are a lot of things uh, that we've done, but there are also a lot of things uh, that we can do. But it all comes back to why we're here today, and that is we've saved a 1,000 lives with naloxone. This is something that, that citizens uh, and, and, and officials all across the state have done in just a year. That's 1,000 people that we've had access to. We've had the possibility of actually getting a, a, a cure, of actually addressing the fundamental problems that, that, that they struggle with, uh, and that's a really good thing. So naloxone is not the, 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 the solution to everything, but it's a start, uh, and I'm really proud of what we've accomplished in, in the year. So uh, I am, uh, I'm gonna come back for, for some questions. We'll all be able to answer questions, but let me turn this over to Lieutenant Governor Mike Stack for a few comments. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mike. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you, Governor Wolf, for your great leadership on this extremely important issue. And uh, what an honor to be here with uh, so many law enforcement officers and uh, these great uh, folks from the legislature, both Republican and Democrat, as we mark a milestone of a thousand lives saved through the use of naloxone. A Pennsylvania and a nation, as the governor said, are in the midst of the worst drug epidemic in recorded history. And I know you all heard this statistic, but it bears saying again, at least seven Pennsylvanians die every day from a drug overdose. Nationwide, we are likely to lose more Americans to overdose this year than we lost in all 12 years of the Vietnam War. 
that's a terrible human tragedy for those we lose and their families and loved ones. It touches people from every part of the state and from every demographic background. This epidemic has such a detrimental, detrimental impact on the broader community too. It puts that emotional stress on medical providers, uh, additional stress on schools, uh, a large portion of crimes are, of course, committed in communities as a result of untreated or undertreated addiction. And it puts additional stress on law enforcement. Police officers must deal with both the uh, illegal drug trade and, of course, all the ancillary crime. But in the midst of carrying out their duty to protect public safety, police officers more and more often also step up and fill that vital caring role of saving the lives of those plagued with opioid addiction. And it's so inspiring to realize what an accomplishment this is, to have saved a thousand lives from naloxone in such a short period of time. It's great news, but it's also a grim reminder of just how widespread this problem is. And of course, the work, as Governor Wolf said, that lies in front of us. We must have a comprehensive comprehensive effort to educate young people. We must make sure that medical providers know the dangers associated with pres prescription drug use. And it's amazing, they still don't. We must destigmatize the disease of addiction. And we must help those who are afflicted with this disease get treatment, and as Governor Wolf said once again, to make sure they continue on that road to recovery. So, under the leadership of Governor Wolf, who has, uh, you know, we've got to commend him because he has made addressing this epidemic a top priority of our administration. And of course, through the able and energetic work of Secretary Dennis and Dr. Levine, Pennsylvania is already setting an example for the rest of the nation in our fight against opioid addiction and overdose deaths. The, the thousand lives saved so far through overdose reversals speaks to the willingness of local police departments throughout Pennsylvania. And as you can see, often these troopers are in the back row, um, but they are often on the front lines. But to have us all be in a collaborative effort, it speaks to the willingness of our law enforcement officers to go above and beyond their responsibilities to make a difference in fighting this healthcare crisis. So to every officer who has saved a life, thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much. <laughs> what you have done is uh, essential, not just for the person whose life was on the brink, but for all of us, every one of us Pennsylvanians, as we battle to conquer this health care scourge. So it's now uh, a pleasure to introduce, uh, I think, Governor Wolf, you did a tremendous job in um, recruiting uh, Secretary Tennis to, to our cabinet, and he's done a wonderful job in uh, being on the front lines to fight this disease. I think he's, uh, he's the best uh, Secretary of Drug and Education in America, Secretary Gary Tennis. It was about a year and a half ago now that uh, Governor Wolf took over, and I remember the second full day of the, the Wolf administration being in a meeting room with the governor, uh, Dr. Levine, and, and uh, others to look at how can we uh, move forward as quickly as possible to get naloxone into the hands of our state troopers. Uh, this exemplifies the deep and passionate commitment that Governor Wolf has brought, and it was a first priority both in time and in priority for this, the Wolf administration. And I want to first and for, for, foremost, I want to thank you, Governor Wolf, for your strong leadership and your, your powerful commitment to addressing this issue. This overdose epidemic is ripping through our communities. It's tearing apart our families. Uh, we have always suffered 
with drug and alcohol addiction and untreated or undertreated drug and alcohol addiction. It has always been in one out of four families. Uh, but now, because of what happened with the, with the, the, the gross overprescribing of opioids that's, that's ramped up over the past 20 years, we are in the midst of the worst overdose epidemic in the history of all humanity. Uh, this is uh, it, it, extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. And I want to uh, also express my tremendous pride in the law enforcement officers, uh, both our state troopers and our municipal police officers, who have had the vision and the courage and the commitment to protect and serve to carry naloxone across the state. We have a really, truly dedicated police force and enlightened police force in, uh, across the state. And I, and I don't think that we could possibly express enough appreciation. This isn't what they signed up for. This is what they have been asked to do, and they have really taken, I think, an enlightened and committed uh, stance in carrying out this effort. And that's evidenced in a thousand human beings that are here walking uh, the, 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 the face of Pennsylvania, uh, the streets of Pennsylvania, and they're still with us today. Um, as Governor Wolf said, it is critical that, that we move beyond just keeping people alive. We know that most people who die of overdoses die, have su suffered overdoses before. So I want you to know, and I have in my hands, the policy that the Wolf Administration has put out to all of our county drug and alcohol directors and the work we've done with hospitals to uh, uh, make sure that our, our folks, when, they're, when they do survive an overdose, that they actually are given, they are, uh, uh, transferred over to drug and alcohol treatment to get better. We are already having great success in Berks County. I heard that they're getting two out of three overdose survivors directly into treatment. Here in Dauphin County and in Washington County, we know that they're actually sending case managers out to the overdose site to begin the intervention right there on the spot to make sure these folks get to the emergency departments and from there get into treatment. We want to get people into recovery. At the end of the day, what we are fighting for is we're fighting for the sacredness of human, the sanctity of human life. And we're also fighting for these people for their recovery. We've got to keep them alive to get them into recovery. Right now, today, we have 23 million Americans in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. And these individuals are our best and finest citizens in the country. They are uh, out there just doing God's work every day. We need to keep them alive so that they can get there. Thank you. Oh. And, and now it's my honor to, to introduce uh, the, the uh, doctor who signed this historic standing order, something that's worth going to medical school alone to do. Uh, I'm, I'm full of envy for that. Uh, thank you for doing that, and thank you for your commitment to this. Dr. Rachel Levine, our physician general. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you, Governor Wolf, uh, Lieutenant Governor Stack, Secretary Tennis, leaders from the uh, General Assembly, our partners in the public safety community and in the treatment community, and of course, our law enforcement officers. As has been noted, the prescription opioid and heroin overdose crisis is the worst public health crisis in Pennsylvania and in the nation. And their response under Governor Wolf's leadership is an interagency response. It's all hands on deck for this crisis. We know evidence of a thousand lives saved that providing our first responders with naloxone saves lives and will be one piece of the puzzle to stem this public health crisis of opioid overdose deaths. Substance, substance abuse disorder and opioid use disorder are diseases. They are not a moral failing. We have to get past the stigma associated with these medical conditions. Everyone's life deserves to be saved, and everyone deserves a chance for recovery. Naloxone is a life-saving medication. It is safe and effective. It does not cause someone to get high. It is not addictive, and it's safe to use. It has one use and one use only, and that's to reverse the fatal effects of an opioid drug overdose. Naloxone can save the life of someone suffering from addiction and an overdose from these prescription opioids and from heroin, giving them an opportunity to get the treatment that they need and a chance for recovery. It can also be used to reverse the effects, the effects of an accidental drug poisoning. The medication has been used successfully by police, 
fire, and other first responders, and today's event is a recognition of that success. Additionally, the medication can be used by a family member or friend who can use it to save the life of one of their loved ones. Often, it is a family member or friend who is, the f is first to find an overdose victim, and minutes can be the difference between life and death. I encourage anyone who is suffering with an opioid addiction or regularly takes prescription opioids, as well as their families, to obtain naloxone for their homes. As the governor noted last year, I signed two standing order prescriptions. The first was for the first responders to carry naloxone, and the second was for the general public to obtain naloxone for, them, for themselves, a friend, or family member. This allows anyone in Pennsylvania to walk into a participating pharmacy and secure naloxone under my prescription. Now, of course, once it is administered, it is critical that the patient then go to the hospital, first for further medical treatment, and then for the warm handoff or the facilitated referral for treatment that has been noted. And working with uh, Secretary Tennis, we are working on emergency department warm handoff guidelines or a clinical pathway in the emergency department for someone to get involved and hooked up with treatment. The prescription opioid and heroin crisis requires a coordinated response from all of us. And under Governor Wolf's leadership, we are working towards that end. So thank you to the police for your partnership and for protecting the public health and the public safety. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Representative Mike Verib, who is chair of the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee of the Pennsylvania Committee for Crime and Delinquency. I stand here, uh, as the Secretary said, as chairman of CJAC on uh, behalf of our chairman of PCCD, Josh Shapiro. And Josh always reminds me to stay on script, and he always knows that I go off script. <laughs> because I've heard some of these speeches ahead of me, and Governor, I hope you don't mind me doing this to your press conference, but what your administration is doing, and Gary, you got my call, uh, right after I was meeting with your staff about one of my gigantic dollar policies, um, I got a call from my sister that my nephew, once again, uh, got hit again, uh, could not survive going without heroin needle out of his arm, young son right next to him for my sister to find. So it hits all of us, doesn't it, Gene? Doesn't it, Michelle? It hits, it hits all of us. And that's why I think the work of this administration, the work of this legislature, I think we all understand that we're not here celebrating that we saved a thousand lives. We are here to say thank you. Because what you also need to understand is that with PCCD's commitment of $120,000 so far and more to come for this naloxone, you're asking police officers, in, in the words of the chief of police of Horsham Township in Montgomery County, you're asking them to revive this person. In one case, they're calling it three first. So police officers who a year or two ago would have arrested and had those folks incarcerated are instead saving their lives. So this is the beginning part of the message. Our police are our triage officers, and PCCD is going to remain committed to support our police, not just with the naloxone, but the training necessary to use of naloxone, the drop boxes, the future monies that we can put out there, it's so important to, to deal with this storm because that's really what we're doing. If, if, if heroin was a natural storm, we would be in a 365 day a year state of emergency, if you think about the numbers. The only way we're gonna deal with it from a PCCD perspective is the help of policy to make sure the money goes in places that are gonna be effective to fix what is going on, and to have the global look that this administration, the Senate, and the House are working together on and recognize. No one in this room or in this Commonwealth has a single answer. It's going to be a collective message that we must work on together. We must share our passions together, and we must recognize that no overdose, no attempted overdose is the same. Families are suffering. We're collective, uh, collective opportunities here for us from the law enforcement perspective, from the policy perspective to move us forward. And again, from PCCD's perspective, we will make sure those monies go in places where not only they're well spent, but are effective and in concert with what the administration and our House and Senate uh, chambers are doing. So that being said, uh, I'm truly honored to be here on behalf of the chairman and at this point offer, it, uh, offer up the uh, podium to the great 
district attorney. I didn't say great York County. I said great district attorney of York County, Tom Kearney. I have been asked to give my perspective on the use of naloxone in three to five minutes. The perspective from the front lines, if you will. And my perspective is this. Three to five minutes is the time that it takes for a human being to die from an opiate overdose. Three to five minutes is the time it should take our legislature to remove naloxone from the list of controlled substances. Three to five minutes is the time that it should take for our legislature to give blanket immunity to anyone who administers naloxone and not just first responders because three to five minutes is the likely response time for law enforcement to arrive. And some, sadly, continue to die in those three to five minutes. Why do we place artificial government impediments on saving lives? Why does Physician General Dr. Levine need to issue a statewide prescription? The reality is that Act Number 139 of 2015 made it more difficult for law enforcement first responders to obtain naloxone than for the general public prior to the, the first order that was uh, issued by Dr. Levine. Naloxone should be an over-the-counter medication. All who administer it should have immunity from suit because it has no side effects. And neighbors, employers, even a stranger who wait those three to five minutes should not have to watch another person die while they wait for first responders to arrive. Additionally, law enforcement needs the authority, the legal authority, to transport an overdosed individual to the warm handoff at a medical facility. Where that epiphany, that enlightenment, that, that decision by the afflicted to change their behavior will most likely occur. Frequently, after saving a life, law enforcement is reduced to collecting the needles and the drug paraphernalia and perhaps illegal drugs and then walking away. Law enforcement currently lacks the legal ability, as recommended by their naloxone training, to compel transport to a hospital for further medical treatment, much less that warm handoff. Yes, we've saved over a thousand lives, and that's reason for celebration. York County, what I described as ground zero north, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the map there, has, alone has saved over 185 lives since April of 2015. Yet, I continue to receive letters that say, let them die. Addicts made their bed and now they should lay in it. That all naloxone programs accomplish is to provide continued customer base for drug dealers. Those who write those letters have never been in law enforcement. They have never had to kneel over a dying teenage boy with a needle in his arm vacantly staring at the ceiling. Desperately applying CPR while the mother nearby sobs repeatedly and praying for naloxone, a naloxone carrying medic to arrive. And all the while knowing that with the simple squirt of spray up somebody's nose, that young man's life could have been saved. Those who write these letters don't understand that many who are saved are not addicts at all. They are your grandparents who because of dementia or simple forgetfulness took too many pills that day. And they are those who are under a doctor's prescription in chronic agony who, sent, who needed just one mil, more pain pill to get through the day. They are our children who because of a stupid mistake a decision at a party are now paying with their life. They're us. That's who's being saved out there using naloxone. 
I will not ask law enforcement to stand down and watch someone die when it is in their power to save a life. I will not ask them to select who should and who should not be saved. It is not for first responders to judge who shall be the quick and who shall be the dead. The resolve to change behavior frequently comes after the afflicted person is revived. And the afflicted cannot act on that resolve when they are dead. These are my thoughts from the front lines. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'd like to introduce Dave Steffen, who's uh, Lancaster County Regional Police, who I like to describe as uh, York County East. Uh, he's formerly a York County uh, Detective Sergeant who I've known well over the years. Uh, David. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor Wolf and honored guests. Looking back to the passage of Act 139, how many of us would have predicted that we'd be celebrating this milestone today? And uh, how many of these milestones have been as successful as this partnership between government and private industry and healthcare providers? Uh, simply put, the use of Narcan by law enforcement saves lives. In my personal career journey, law enforcement has now lasted over 30 years. I've seen many initiatives for addressing public safety, traffic safety, technology, crime reduction, and other problems affecting the quality of life. Some have worked and some have fallen short. Simply put, the use of naloxone by law enforcement has saved lives and lots of them. We celebrate the 1,000 lives milestone today, as we should, but the number has a lot of different meanings most obvious being that the program works. Another is the willingness of progressive law enforcement leaders, the agencies they represent, and their members to see the victims as more than drug users, but as persons who are prone to the frailties of human nature and the human condition. We also look beyond the user and into the eyes and hearts of their families and others destroyed by that drug-related behaviors. The number 1,000 represents a starting point for where we stand as professionals as we go forward. We need to continue to engage those law enforcement agencies who have not used naloxone to this point and illustrate to them their obligation to do so from both a moral perspective and from a professional development perspective. We need to continue to embrace the need to use Narcan and be diligent in our efforts to continue to fight on a multidisciplinary level. As a team going forward, we need the flexibility to identify problems, implement solutions, and to do so in a timely and thoughtful manner. As we heard here today, we need tools to get the person that we've done the reversal on into that warm handoff to increase their chances of survival, and more importantly, to increase their chances of recovery. Opioid addiction and abuse is not a criminal justice issue, it's a public health issue. Uh, we need to approach it as a partnership, law enforcement engaging in community relationships, networking, reaching out to people in need, providing them the referrals they need in order to be successful in their journey towards recovery. Most of all, we need to continue to go forward with hope, uh, knowing that we in policing are members of an honorable and respected profession one of the ability to take a life as to well as to save it. The number 1,000 reflects the real law enforcement officers I know, ones who are lifesavers and problem solvers, those that reflect so well in their agencies, communities, and the Commonwealth. And our work is undone. So uh, as we go forward, we want to make the 2,000 uh, milestone as soon as we can. Thank you. And I forgot to introduce the reason that we're here. Chris. Chris has a, Chris has a story better than all of ours put together. 
Hi, my name is Chris Benedetto. Um, I am a person in long-term recovery, and what that means is that I haven't had a drink or a drug since January 19, 2010. Um, um, I just wanted to thank you guys, because, uh, you know, not too long ago, I can remember that uh, there wasn't that much attention on this. Um, and, like, the work you guys are doing is really beneficial on the front lines. Um, it really is. Um, so I have had um, a few experiences with naloxone. Um, this was before it was actually um, given to police departments um, and made available to the public. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, I've been revived multiple, multiple times. I have been reversed multiple times. Um, and the reality is, at those points in my life, um, I couldn't see where I'd be today. I couldn't see that I was a son. I couldn't see that I was, you know, a significant other. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't see the benefits I would be bringing not only to, um, you know, the community that I live in, but my employer. I couldn't see that stuff. Um, I was only, I, it was hard for me to survive um, not only using, but not using. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of thank the people who saw the vision, you know, that, that saw like that I was more than, you know, somebody who was just made a moral, you know, a moral defective decision, right? Um, you know, because the reality is you guys um, saw what I couldn't at that time. Um, I was suicidal. I, that's basically what it boils down to, right? Um, I had no hope using or not. And when you took my solution away, I was angry. Um, and a lot of the, the law enforcement people, um, the people that picked me up off of the pavement, saw that. Um, and you know, thank you guys for being vigilant. Thank you for not just walking away and saying, there he goes again, right? Thank you for standing there and taking me to the same spot the same time, right? Because um, without that, I wouldn't have the opportunity to get introduced into long-term recovery. Um, and what that looks like for me today is like, I'm going to college. Like, who would have thought, right? Um, um, I'm, I'm not only active in my, in my family again, um, and my home life, um, and like an active part of that, but I'm also active in my community. Um, I'm active with the people around me. And you know, um, People used to, you know, people still tell me today, I can't believe what used to be, right? Um, the reality is without you guys um, and without, you know, being reversed multiple, <laughs> multiple times, right, um, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. Um, and not only that, but the people in my life wouldn't have the opportunity to see me who I am today. Um, so, you know, thank you guys because I know it's frustrating and I know it's irritating um, because I was, right? Um, but it's really important that we give you, you know, everyone um, that stems from the same spot I did, you know, an opportunity to um, have what I have today, you know, so thanks. I think Chris said it better than anybody else here. We, you all said it really wonderfully, but that's why we're doing this. Because think of what our society, what Pennsylvania, is going to be like when Chris and everybody else suffering from this disease not only survives but thrives and does the things that, that Chris is doing. That's going to be a great thing, not just for Chris, not just for the, the sufferers, but for all of us. And, and that's why we're doing this. So this is really important for us. So thank you for allowing us to do the right thing. Appreciate it.